Hermanos y hermanas, en este día de Pentecostés le pido al Señor nuestro Dios que nos ilumine, nos guíe, nos muestre los caminos del Señor. Dear brothers and sisters, in this day of Pentecost, I pray to God for the Holy Spirit to show us the right way and to guide us and lead us in every step of the way. Que el Señor les bendiga. Amén. Thank you, God, for our church, for our ministers, and for our wonderful staff. Hello, everybody. Hey, happy our birthday, church. church. Happy Pentecost. Happy birthday, church. We love you. We love you all. Bye-bye. <laughs> happy, happy birthday, birthday church. church. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Happy birthday, Church! There it is. Viene Espiritu Santo. Happy Pentecost Day. Happy birthday, Church. Siku ya kuz de la wa ya baraha. Happy Pentecost Church, happy birthday. Alice Guta Zunkabershta Kersha. Happy birthday, Church. Come, Come into our hearts, hearts Holy, Holy Spirit. Spirit. Amen. Amen. Happy birthday, Church. Happy birthday, Church. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. Come. Come, Holy Spirit. Greetings, friends. My name is Jason Jones. I serve as senior pastor for the Bartley United Methodist Church. Our mission is to know Christ and to make Christ known to all people through worship, education, and service in our community and throughout the world. It's a blessing to worship with you on this Pentecost Sunday, and we pray that you find blessing through our offering. May the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all.
Please join me in the call to worship by responding as requested on your screen. Come, Holy Spirit, the wind of God, the breath of life. Come, Holy Spirit, our advocate, our counselor. Come, Holy Spirit, teacher of wisdom, reminder of Christ. Come, Holy Spirit, grant of forgiveness, giver of peace. Come, Holy Spirit, May we feel God breathing through our Lord worship. May we receive the Holy Spirit in this place. Amen. Let us pray. O oh God, you sent the Holy Spirit to enkindle the zeal of Christ's followers waiting in Jerusalem for his promised gift. Pour the same inspiration on your people and on the church throughout the world. Revive the power of the gospel in our hearts that it may be to us a sacred trust for the blessing of all creation. Enable your church to spread the good news of salvation so that all nations may hear it in their own tongues and welcome it into their own lives. Protect, encourage, and bless all ministers of the cross and prosper their words and works so that Jesus, being lifted up, may draw all people unto him, and the kingdoms of the world may become the kingdom of our Lord and of Jesus Christ. Amen. Our first scripture reading comes from the book of Acts. 
the second chapter, verses 1 through 21. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly from heaven there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind. And it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as a fire appeared among them. And a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Now there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven and living in Jerusalem. And at this sound the crowd gathered and was bewildered because each one heard them speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, are not all who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt, and parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene and visitors from Rome, both the Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. In our own languages, we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others sneered and said, they are filled with new wine. But Peter, Standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them, Men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you, and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk as you suppose, for it is only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what was spoken through the prophet Job. In the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even upon my slaves, both men and women in those days, I will pour out my spirit, and they will prophesy. I will show portents in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and smoky mist. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the Lord's great and glorious day. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Our second reading comes from 1 Corinthians, the 12th chapter, verses 3 through 13. No one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of service, but the same Lord. And there are variety of activities, but it is the same God who activates all of them in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. To one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom. To another the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit. To another faith by the same Spirit. To another the gifts of healing by the one Spirit to another the working of miracles, and to another prophecy, and to another the servant of spirits, to another various kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. All of these are activated by one and the same Spirit, who allots to each one individually just as the Spirit chooses. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many are one body, so it is with Christ. For in the one spirit we are all baptized into one body. Jews or Greeks, 
slaves or free, we are we're all made to drink of one spirit. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Hey friends, uh, good morning. I hope you are having a wonderful Sunday on this Pentecost Sunday. And I'm sure by now you are wondering why I am dressed like this. Um, you may be thinking that I have lost my mind a little bit. It's true. Um, I also feel like there's always a good reason to get a second use out of a Halloween costume. And I felt like today, this campfire costume could also represent the Holy Spirit. And so that is what I want to talk with you about this morning. So we've discussed in, over the past few weeks that Jesus has spent his time here, you know, building disciples. He wanted his disciples to go out and to preach about God and acceptance and love and to prove that he was the chosen one. He went to the cross and he came back. And last Sunday, we talked about how he ascended into heaven. He went to join his father in heaven and the disciples were sad that he was leaving again. And he said, don't worry, I am going to give you something that'll make you feel like I am with you all the time. What he did is he set a fire in their souls and sent them the Holy Spirit. And so today I sit here dressed as the Holy Spirit, reminding you that Jesus sent his spirit and it appeared like a fire, encouraging the disciples to go and share the good news, share the gospel with everyone they met, any way that they could, as often as they could. He wanted them to feel alive with the Holy Spirit even if he was no longer here to share that. And so today, I want you to look at me and look at the colors that adorn our sanctuary. And I want you to be alive with the Holy Spirit, remembering that it is your job to go and share the good news with everyone that you encounter. So I want you to remember that. I want you to do your very best to share the good news like a fire. Let it run rampant in your lives. Will you pray with me this morning? Dear God, thank you so much for the Holy Spirit. Lord, we are so thankful that the Holy Spirit comes to us in times that we need it and in times that we don't realize that we need it. Lord, we are thankful for that reminder that is ever present in our lives, even as you and your son might not be here with us, your Holy Spirit is. Lord, we are so thankful for you and so thankful that we have this opportunity to praise you and the Holy Trinity together on this Pentecost Sunday. Lord, we ask that you be with us this week as we continue in our daily tasks and our spreading of the good news and the gospel of Jesus Christ. Lord, we are thankful for you, we praise you, and we ask that you keep us safe until we're all together again. Lord, we ask all these things in your son's most precious name. Amen. See you next week, friends.
This morning, our gospel lesson comes to us from the gospel according to St. John, chapter 7, verses 37 through 39. And here's what it says. On the last day of the festival, the great day, while Jesus was standing there, he cried out, Let anyone who is thirsty come to me, and let the one who believes in me drink. As the scripture has said, Out of the believer's heart shall flow rivers of living water. Now he said this about the Spirit, which believers in him were to receive. For as yet there was no Spirit, because Jesus was not yet glorified. And this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Today, as we worship, we can and we should do so with rejoicing. Because today, as we worship, we celebrate life. On this day, we celebrate the birth of the church. Today is Pentecost, whereupon we remember the Holy Spirit's descent and, and the mighty power which filled those who had gathered to receive it. Traditionally, we, we point to Pentecost as the day of the church as we know it, the one holy Catholic and Apostolic Church was born through the realization of the life-giving Spirit of God. It's the coming of that Spirit that moves things. It's the coming of that Spirit that enlightens things. It's the coming, dear friends, of that Spirit that awakens things. The fact is, that whether we're talking about the church in a very broad and general sense, one which includes all Christians across temporal and spatial boundaries, across theological or doctrinal barriers, denominational lines, and any other means of classification that we've constructed, or the whether we're talking about the church in a more localized sense. Our congregation, or one up the street, or one on the other side of town. We know that we are changed. We know that we are strengthened. We know that we are propelled forward by one source and one source only. The Spirit of God. Promised by Jesus and poured out on the day of Pentecost. The Spirit who inspires our hearts to sing a new song and to give ourselves fully to the one who formed that heart. But I have to confess, for as much joy and as much jubilation as usually surrounds it, I'm not entirely comfortable with the Pentecost story as the Scripture betrays. In fact, I wrestle with it, and I am tested by it. And there are at least a couple of reasons for this. And one is because it challenges my perceptions of the Holy Spirit, the, the character and the nature of the Spirit. Now, we should all know what the Spirit does, because Jesus describes this for us. Prior to leaving them, he told his disciples that the Holy Spirit would arrive to be an advocate, to be a helper. And that this Spirit would teach, this Spirit would remind. He told them further that that they wouldn't be left orphaned, that the Spirit would be their comforter. And, and St. Paul says that it's by the Spirit that we are led, by the Spirit that we are kept from fear 
and that we are given witness of our being God's own. What's more, it's the Spirit who imparts, as the Spirit sees fit, gifts. Gifts of wisdom and, and of knowledge and gifts of faith and of healing, work of the miracles, gifts of prophecy and discernment, things to which Jesus was referring when he said that his followers would do even greater things than he did. And that's all fine and good. The rub, for me, comes chiefly in the way that the Spirit arrives. You see, we're used to, and I would guess more at ease with, thinking about the Spirit in terms of, of a quietly descending dove, as depicted in the stories of Jesus' baptism. We are more prone to speak of the Spirit as a still, small voice. Even the biblical words for Spirit in Hebrew, ruach, in Greek, pneuma, they carry a, a gentle connotation as they are often translated as breath. And to be sure, the Spirit frequently is subtle, kind of nudging or prodding instead of insisting. But here, here the Spirit is portrayed as anything but gentle. The Spirit here is neither timid nor meek and doesn't seem to provide very much comfort. In the Pentecost story that we heard from Acts, God's Spirit is wild. God's Spirit is loud. God's Spirit is invasive, shaking the lives of those first followers of Jesus, whether they are ready or not. I mean, look at the words that are used. Words like sudden and rush and violent, wind and fire. Not one of these terms is particularly calm or serene. They don't seem to align well with our Lord saying, peace. I leave with you. Honestly, they convey a sense of that which is beyond human control, beyond human containment. They certainly don't conjure up images of something to be confined or, or pocketed for use until it's convenient. And nor do they cause me to imagine something calm or passive. No, when I hear these words, I get very different sorts of pictures, pictures that are potent, pictures that are dominant, pictures that are even destructive. Destructive. It doesn't seem to wash on a day that is supposed to be about birth and creation. New things, things being made whole. It doesn't make sense. Until we remember what Jesus says. Until we remember what Jesus shows us. That death is necessary for life. And that leaving behind the old must take place so that we can make room for the inbreaking new. The Spirit of God necessarily crashes into our lives like a wrecking ball. 
to destroy the rotten structures that aren't fit for habitation and to level to the ground those walls behind which we attempt to hide from our true selves and from others and even from God. honest, that is precisely what makes the words used here so disconcerting. Because I want to be who and what I want to be. I want to serve my interests. And I want to do that which is best for me and mine. Which frankly, is not entirely problematic until I begin to do so irrespective of what that may mean for anyone else. Because in order for me to be who and what God wants me to be, in order for me to do what God chooses for me to do, those towers that I have constructed just might need to come down, and it can hurt when they begin to tumble. But in their place, something new and something beautiful is built. Something forged neither by my own hands nor by my own force of will. It is a life breathed by God into which I am graciously invited. Into which each of us are graciously invited and into which we live as we call upon that very spirit to inspire, to inspire. And this is really where the other challenge of the Pentecost narrative comes in. Because the first, as I've been describing, is a challenge to perceptions of how the Spirit works. But the second is a challenge to perceptions of what the body of Christ church, formed and led by that spirit, is going to look like. Were I to guess, I'd say most of us likely have little or no problem with the notion of the spirit giving us strength and boldness, giving us zeal and passion, endowing us with gifts and graces. And indeed, the Spirit does all of this in abundance. Friends, what I would like to say to you is that it's neither the strength nor the zeal that primarily define the church. What defines the church is that it be a reflection of the kingdom of God, a glimpse of what God desires on earth as in heaven. And just what does God desire? Well, I believe that more than anything, God desires the redemption of all that God has made. I believe that God desires that all would turn to their maker and find life. And I believe that every person has their part to play in bringing this to pass. Through the mouth of the prophet, God reveals something of this when it is said, In the last days I will pour out my Spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams, even upon my slaves, both men and women, in those days I will pour out my spirit and they shall prophesy. And everyone 
who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Everyone. Not some. And certainly not those whom we find worthy. But, unfortunately, that is a common mindset in some circles, in some denominations, and even in some congregations. Among certain faith communities, they would like to limit who's in and decide who's out. But dear ones, this isn't what God has in mind. Because God paints a picture that includes all flesh, sons and daughters, young and old, men and women, not only among those who are called to salvation, but also among those who are called to service, among those who are called to be prophetic voices, admonishing God's people, all of God's people, to newness of life and of heart. The Apostle says it in this way. In the one Spirit, we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slave or free, and we were all made to drink of one Spirit. To state it simply, the Church as envisioned at the New Testament Pentecost, is one wherein everyone is graciously included and everyone's gifts are incorporated within the church. There is a place for everybody. But the church in the 21st century, indeed, Humanity in the 21st century. We don't always measure up to this ideal. The shameful reality is that we often divide and segregate. The shameful reality is that we are prone to mistrust to violate and to harm. And we do this in so many ways. Some unintentional, some very much intentional, some based on differences beyond our ability to control, like, like skin color and gender and ability and and others based on what a person has in her or his bank account, or what sort of family they come from, or their political affiliations, and still others based on deeper differences, be they theological or moral or the like. But we know these things. We know these things. And we are aware of our individual and our corporate culpability. I certainly know these answers for myself. I know that I have, in myriad ways, placed limitations and, and restrictions on people based upon little more than preconceived notions or, or stereotypes or statuses. I know that I have denigrated based on some sort of agenda that has nothing at all to do with that other person being a child of God. I know that I have wielded my privilege to discriminate and to deal unjustly. And I also know that in the midst of my self-serving ways, in the midst of my overinflated sense of importance, the Spirit comes and comes again to swing that wrecking ball and obliterate those tendencies. I know that the Spirit comes to blow the winds of change and to ignite a fire that both incinerates the trash in my life while rekindling the flame of 
holiness, I know that the Spirit comes to inspire my heart such that my vision of who and what the church is and what my responsibility to my fellow creatures ought to be might stand corrected and that my proclivity toward imbalanced self-regard might be filtered into nourishing, cleansing rivers of living water that flow toward all who thirst. Thanks be to God. The Spirit descends. Sometimes gently. Sometimes forcefully. But always to provide us with everything that we need to be made anew. Sustained on our journey. Indeed, on our human journey, as we go on to perfection. Those first disciples of the Christ, they were gathered in that place some 2,000 years ago, and they were waiting just as Jesus had instructed them. We, in ways that are too many and too varied to name, we are also waiting. And still waiting as it pertains to what the Spirit of God designs to do in us and through us, waiting is not the hardest part. The real challenge, dear ones, lies in welcoming the Spirit who comes. Even if, even when, we are discomforted by the message that's brought. Even if, even when, we are stretched by the truth that's spoken. The challenge lies in welcoming our hearts to be inspired, our lives to be changed, and the church to be born. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. This morning, as our response to the word, May we join our voices together in the affirmation of faith that's found in the United Methodist Hymnal on page 880. The words will also be on the screen for you to follow along. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is, seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, he suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in the one holy, Catholic, and apostolic Church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen.
Now receive these words of benediction and a blessing. Children of God, go forth in peace. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.